And Father, again, we thank you for the place you've given to us before your throne. Uh, we, we come boldly, Lord, because you've washed us with your blood. You've given us a right standing with you through your Son. And now we can seek the grace and the mercy that you know that we need. I pray for Delaney this evening, the things she's going through, the trials, the difficulties within the family. And uh, we pray that you'd give her wisdom. We pray that she would sense your spirit speaking with her, bringing to remembrance those things you've taught her, uh, bringing new ideas that come from your Holy Spirit. I pray you give her ears to hear and give her a peace that you promise to those who pray, uh, that you'd give a peace that transcends all understanding. So we pray for her this evening, praying for a good report. Again, we pray you'd bless the teaching of your word, that you receive glory, Jesus, as you so deserve it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good to see you. The book of Numbers. If you have a Bible, if you want to turn there. We're going to find a lot of genealogies in Numbers, a lot of names that we find hard to pronounce. I already have committed to the Lord that I'll have apologies going around in heaven to these men that God names out that I have a tough time pronouncing. Um, at the same token, I, I read in my Bible that we're going to give it a new name. Their names in heaven are much easier than the ones that he's given them in Hebrew. Uh, numbers, called the fourth book of Moses, as you guys know, Genesis, Exodus, and Numbers. It's also called the Book of Journeys, uh, a book of murmurings. I sure pray that as we allow God's word to study us, that we'll find ourselves faithful in praise and gratitude and not like the Israelites who were known for their murmuring that kept them out of the fullness of God. Abundant life, Jesus promised us, but it's got to be his way. The book of murmurings, or more aptly, I would say the wilderness wanderings. Ever been in a wilderness in your spiritual walk? If you haven't, it's coming. It's just a matter of time. But it's those times where we get to see what God sees in our hearts. The weeds, as Pastor Josh mentioned, or was it Rich? Somebody mentioned it in regards to the weeds in our heart. It's in the wilderness that we, he exposes them. And we get to see what's really going on at a heart level. And it'll cause you to do one of two things. You'll either repent or you'll just grow older. What a sad thought that is, that we simply can grow old in the Lord, never be more mature in Christ, never bearing more fruit for the kingdom, but simply getting physically older. Unfortunately, I would say that's the majority I pray that's not for you. I expect different. You're here Wednesday night seeking the Lord. Good for you. What is the most popular book ever written? Anybody? What's that? <laughs> the Bible. There you go. Brian got it. The Bible. Hands down. It's also the most unread. But we're starting the Bible tonight. What's the second most popular book that was written? Anybody? That's correct. Pastor Rich, right on the money. Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan. You know when he wrote it? Or where he was when he wrote it? Yeah, he was in prison. Hmm. <clears throat> Paul seemed to write some letters, I think, in prison too, didn't he? What does that suggest to you? That God needed him alone? God had things to say he wanted to say through a man, so he put him in solitary so that he could hear clearly from God's spirit to speak the things that we can now enjoy and relish in. Uh, Pilgrim's Progress is an allegory uh, of the Christian pilgrimage to the celestial city. If you haven't read it, I would encourage it's a must read. You ought to read it. They have it in kids' form for my grandkids this last Christmas. Really well done. Um, it prepares them as well. Charles Spurgeon said this about the book of Numbers. Like Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, it is not alone a history of one person or a nation, but it is the picture of the life of all God's people. 
wilderness wanderings. You see, we are all going to experience some wilderness wanderings in our journey as pilgrims. The question is whether we'll, again, by faith, grow through the lessons or just grow older and die in the desert fruitless. God's will is that you bear fruit and that more abundantly. To bear much fruit for the kingdom is Jesus' words. Regardless of your, of your age today, would you ask yourself the question when you're alone, am I growing? Not am I going through the motions. You, you can come to church. You can say the right things. You can answer Jesus all the time because that's usually the right answer. But are you growing? Are you being stretched? Is God taking you to different places? Is he showing you different things to expose areas of growth? But you have to ask the question. I pray that you would. Let me give you a little bit of background before we jump into numbers. The Israelites, as you remember, have been freed from bondage in Egypt 400 years, experienced the awesome display of God's power over the enemy. Remember 10 plagues, water turns to blood, frogs come out, the darkness that you could touch, firstborn dying, lice. God just did a work, and the people just got to see it. They crossed the Red Sea. They watched the enemy get destroyed as they pursued them. They watched God provide water from the rock, saw manna from heaven in the desert, and then they went to Mount Sinai where Moses would receive the Ten Commandments by the very finger of God. We got to read, if you've gone through the teachings and you've been through the first four books, you found that the people were unfaithful. Even at Mount Sinai, they decided to worship another god at the hands of Aaron. There they camped and built a tabernacle of meeting as a center of worship and sacrifice. They established a priesthood and were instructed as the proper way to worship God in the book of Leviticus. That brings us to Numbers chapter 1, verse 1. Actually, a portion of verse 1. Now the Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the tabernacle of meeting, 150 times in numbers and in more than 20 different ways, God spoke to Moses. Don't you find that riveting? I don't know about you, but I'd like to be Moses, to hear from God, to sit face to face with God, to get direct revelation from him for the things that are yet to come. Exodus, you can turn there with me, 33, starting in verse 7. This is a picture of his intimacy with the Almighty. What does that do when, I, when you hear those words? Intimacy with the Almighty. Well, we understand intimacy as the intimacy, right? We allow people to see in. Well, God already sees everything. So he wants us to see him. But we have to have a relationship with him. And when you're born again of the Spirit of God, you now have the Holy Spirit living in you. And now you have access through Jesus' blood to the throne room of God. And you can have conversation with him any time of the day, any time of the night. He is willing and wanting you to come and have intimacy with him. In Exodus 33, starting in verse 7, now you'll find that this is the tent. It wasn't the one that God had revealed to Moses that they built. Uh, but yet they had a place of meeting a place where they could meet. It says, Moses took his tent and pitched it outside the camp, far from the camp, and, it call, and called it the tabernacle of meeting. It came to pass that everyone who sought the Lord went out to the tabernacle of meeting, which was outside the camp. So it was whenever Moses went out to the tabernacle that all the people rose, and each man stood at his tent and watched Moses until he had gone into the tabernacle. And it came to pass when Moses entered the tabernacle that the pillar of cloud descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle and the Lord talked with Moses. All the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the tabernacle door, and all the people rose and worshipped, each man in his own door, tent door. So the Lord spoke to Moses face to face, as a man speaks to his friend. And he would return to camp. But his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, did not depart from the tabernacle. 
What a scene. A man meeting with God? Face to face? Getting to hear from God? Is that possible yet today? We see the ramifications of this intimacy in the life of Moses. We're going to find two to two and a half million people left the exodus in Egypt. And he had to lead those people. I don't know about you, but sometimes I find it hard to lead myself, much less somebody else. Take a wife on, take some kids, take a congregation as Pastor Josh, Pastor Rich. It's like, oh my, you better be hearing from the Lord. And quite frankly, the more that we hear from the Lord, the more that intimacy is developed, the more God can give us as a good steward of what he's already given to us. Joshua got it. Joshua gets it here. It's where he's, why he's where he's at. Joshua here gets it. Something's going on here, and I like it. So I'm just going to park here for a while, and I'm just going to stay and linger in his presence. You know, we pray here, and it's been my heart's prayer, that God's presence would be felt when you walk through those doors, that there'd just be a sweet presence of his. And I don't understand how all that works, I just know by experience it's true. And I don't bank my theology on my experience. I bank it on the word of God. But I do know Jesus. And I have experienced his presence. And when it's rich, and when that time with the Lord is intimate, you walk away refreshed. You walk away knowing that you've been in his presence. And it's all good for the day. And I say that to say, Morning time's a great time to meet with the Lord before the day, before the difficulty that are to come. He can prepare your heart for those things. It's on us to seek him with all our hearts because we have that promise, right? If you seek him, you'll find him if you seek him with all your heart. It's upon us. It's a conditional promise. So we find Joshua here getting prepared as well. Long before Moses was moving on, before he vacated because of his own disobedience, God was raising up Joshua. And Joshua had a very early in his discipleship understood that. So this is 101. Unfortunately, in the church, it's, it's, it's not 101. It's everything else. This should be 101 in our walks with the Lord. How's your quiet time? I have to ask myself that too. Boy, I'll tell you, it needs to change. I need to have more time with the Lord. I don't know about you. Days are busy. You know, the thing is, we get 24 hours in a day, and we all have the same amount of time. And we can say what we want. We get done what we want, what's important. I understand we need to work. I understand we have responsibility. I understand all those things, like you do. But when it really comes down to it, we do what we think is important. If you don't see the need there, ask the Lord. And I'll tell you, it, it will rock your world. It'll change who you are if you start getting in his presence alone. What am I going to do when I get there? Well, if you do a study in, uh, of God talking to man and man talking to God, you'll find something amazing when you see Adam talking with God and um, Abraham talking with God and God talking with them. The amount of words that are shared by God far outnumber the words that are shared by man. It's not even close. We got it backwards. We think prayer is all about what we want to share. Well, God already knows all that stuff. It's not that he doesn't want us to share. He loves us for his children. But he wants to speak. He wants to direct. He wants to give you insight and wisdom and revelation. But you have to listen. I liken it often to... Your mom that calls, or your father, someone really close, you don't pick up and say, who's this? Right? You just know their voice. How is that? How did that happen? Well, over a period of time, you develop an intimate relationship with that person. So when they talk, you hear, and you just go, I know who you are. You don't tell me who you are. Well, that's the same with the Lord. Do you know his voice? In the days that are coming, you will need to hear his voice, and so will I. 1999, there was some straight winds that came through Appleton. My wife and I and two kids were living above the Zemples, which is right down the street from here, on Winnebago, right on this corner. Um, 
and we were living upstairs. We were on the move, and a um, storm came, and we grabbed the kids, and we were standing in this upstairs little apartment. It's a bed, bedrooms now, and the window started doing this, and you went, oh, this is not good. And shortly thereafter, Henry yelled up from the door downstairs, you guys got to get down here. So we all piled down in their basement, and there we sat. And after reflecting on that, I was praying, talking to the Lord, what, what was that about? And the Lord said, you're going to need to hear my voice in the future. When, because the time to cry out to me is not during the storm. It's for the storm. To know when the storm comes, what you're supposed to do. The storms are coming for you personally, for us corporately, for our nation. And you're either going to be one that says, what should we do and who should I follow? Or give me a second, let me talk to the Lord. You make those decisions today and God will honor that. Uh, back to Numbers. So developing intimacy, certainly in prayer, it's abiding in him and during the day. We can't just sit and have coffee and talk with the Lord all day, though I would like to sometimes. Um, so we abide, right? We, we keep counsel with the Lord throughout the day. It shouldn't be uncommon for you as a Christian to X, Y, Z, something's happening. I see an ambulance come by. One, one time my wife said, we ought to pray. An ambulance went by and I thought, you know, that really stuck. Someone's in need. What's the matter with me? I'm on my way to work. I got things to do. I'm listening to the radio. It's a good message. It was an ambulance that went by. Someone needs help. They need help driving in our crazy transportation um, that they have to go through, right? So that would make sense, right? How about pray for the drivers? Pray for safe travel to get to them. Pray for that person that is in crisis mode. And what happens in crisis mode? I don't know about you, but most people come to Christ when they're in crisis mode. What a great opportunity it is to pray. But you have to be, it has to come from the beginning of the day, not a thought in the middle of the day. It's like, there's one for you. Now, the next time you see an ambulance, the Lord, God's Spirit will bring it back to you, and you'll go, I should be praying, and it's time to pray. And you have counsel with the Lord throughout the day. Now, that's just one thing. It should be happening all the time. As we grow in the Lord, it ought to be, we're praying about everything. Oh, boy, I got to sit down with my manager. Yee, I got these customers that are tough for me in sales. Lord, I need some help here. You know, there's this constant, you're walking with him throughout the day, abiding in him. I would consider creating times of worship. Now, for some, worship looks different than others. For me personally, I love to worship the Lord in song. Give me a headset, let me crank it up, and let me worship the Lord. It's a great, but again, it's got to be intentional. It just doesn't happen. No one's going to say, you ought to go worship the Lord. <laughs> They're not going to tell you that. They're not going to encourage you that. But I'm going to encourage you to do that. Worship the Lord, whatever that looks like for you. Uh, journaling is another way. Journaling your journey. You know, writing down what's going on in my world. Being able to look back and go, Lord, I've been talking with you about this and then see the response a month later, six weeks later, and go, man, the Lord was listening. Yeah, he's always listening. Journaling is a great, effective way to stay in tune with what the Lord is doing. 1B, it says, on the first day of the second month, in the second year, after they had come out of the land of Egypt, again, on the first day of the second month, in the second year. Now we read, just from a timing perspective, I want to point out it's numbers. Numbers are important to the Lord. And you're going to find that here. I'm going to point out one, I think, golden nugget, at least for me, in regards to the timing of things. Exodus 19.1 says, On the third day after the children of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt on the same day, they came to the wilderness of Sinai. So if you will, from the Exodus to Mount Sinai was about three months.
Uh oh. <laughs> See, I was trying to conserve and print on both sides of the paper, and now I got a mess. Uh-oh. Um, maybe that's two, three, four. I think I just had one B gone. Um, so 19, Exodus 19, 1, it was three months from Sinai to Mount, to, uh, from the Exodus to Mount Sinai, about three months. It's about a year at, at, at the book of Leviticus was written. You're closing in on two years by the time they come to Kadesh Barnea. That's where I was headed. Why? Why is that important? Well, we hear 40 years. If you said, how long were the Israelites in the desert? We would say 40 years, time of testing. How long were in their rebellion? Well, when we went to Kadesh Barnea, remember 12 spies were sent out, 10 come back, and they say, uh, uh, I don't think so. Uh, did you see the giants in the land? Did, look at the grapes. We carried them on a pole. They're this big. There's no way. There's no way. And I have to say, they had to be giants. I say that because they just saw God do miraculous things, unbelievable things. They got to see the water close on the enemy, water out of a rock, manna from the sky, frogs, blood. I mean, what more could you, that you would have to trust God? Oh, God's in control. We can do anything, you would think. And yet they responded with, um, well, we're like grasshoppers in their eyes. Uh, I, I don't think we can do this. And of course, Joshua and Caleb said, are you kidding me? That's my words, of course. Are you kidding me? Did you, did you just not see what, what happened? I would suggest to you that in large part is the church. You're going to have one or two guys just go, are you kidding me? You, you, you don't think, what? And you can have these people going, ah, I'm not really sure this is going to work out. Did you see the numbers last month? I mean, there's all kinds of things that you can say <laughs> that we have, to, we have to come to the place of going, God can do anything. If God calls us to do something, and he shows us it, it's, it's true to his word, and we have confirmation, we should say, praise God, I have no idea how this is going to work, but we're in the best place possible because God spoke it, he said it, he confirmed it, and he's going to do it. So let's hang on for the ride and see what he's going to do. We don't want to be naysayers. We don't want to be in the desert for 38 years. 38 years. And it's page I needed the most, but I'm going to try to remember in John chapter 5, John chapter 5, numbers mean something. John chapter 5, starting in verse 1, we're going to read through 15. Remember 38, 38 years from the time of the rebellion, before they came back to the same place they started at. 38 years in rebellion. Do you think the Jews knew that? Oh, they, they memorized most of the Old Testament. Did they not know 38 years in the desert? If we would say to them as Gentiles, yeah, yeah, I know you guys were in rebellion for 40 years, they'd look at you sideways, you Gentiles. It's 38 years we were in rebellion from Kadesh Barnea to the time we came right back until all those 20 and up had died. Why is that significant? John chapter 5, starting in verse 1. It says, After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into a pool and, stepped up and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Where were their eyes at that time? Where were their eyes? Was it on the Lord? I think they're looking at the water. They're waiting for an angel. What happened to looking to the Lord for all that we need? Well, they're looking at the water. 
Now, a certain man was there who had an infirmity, how many years? 38 years. The Jew says, what? 38 years? 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and he knew he had already been in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? What kind of question is that for someone that's been sick for 38 years? Do you want to be made well? We tend to like to stay where we're at until God pushes us out. Now, he wants us to leave the place where we're at to grow. And it's just able to stay where we're at. And so we stay. No different for the man that's sick for 38 years. He's just comfortable doing what he's doing. This is life. Why should I expect anything different? So he has to ask him that question to jar him out of his, re- his own reality. The sick man answered him and said, Sir, I have no one to put me in the, in the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I'm coming, another steps down before me. So he's looking for Jesus to be his pusher. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Almighty God in front of you. <laughs> and he's, he's looking for Jesus to push him in the water. Okay. So Jesus said to him, Rise, take up your bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed, and walked. And that day was the Sabbath. Uh, intentional. Then the Jews there for a second, who was cured, it is the Sabbath. It is not possible for you to carry your bed. He answered them, he who made me well said to him, take up your bed and walk. Then they asked him, who is this man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? Healed, did not know who it was, for Jesus was drawn. A multitude being in that place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see, you have been made well. Sin no more lest the worst thing come upon you. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. Sin no more. What does that imply? That it was, well, not to sin again, but that the issue that caused him the 38 years of illness was sin. Sin no more. He pointed him back to whatever you're doing, stop doing it. To the woman that was caught in adultery, didn't he say the same thing? No one condemns you. Neither do I condemn you. To just go, and no more. So the Jew hears this, and they think, you're talking about us. 38 years in the desert, in rebellion, in sin? How dare you? And you do it on the Sabbath to boot. Well, he got their attention. And to the Jew listening, he under- they understood perfectly what he was saying. Numbers mean something. 38 years in the desert in rebellion. And now he's telling the Jews, you're in rebellion too, just like your forefathers. And we need to be careful because we too can fall into those same traps, right? We all have weeds in our heart. We all have issues, strongholds, sometimes footholds, toeholds, whatever they are. God wants to weed those things out. And if we are unwilling to yield to the working of God's spirit, we can die in the desert and be unfruitful. He's come to give you life, and that more abundantly. Abundant life. When you're there, you just think, this is it. I'm in heaven. It's all good. God God uses you to bear fruit for the kingdom. You get to share the gospel with somebody. You see them respond, and you just think, this is it. You just stay in this place right now. This is perfect. You're bearing fruit for the kingdom of God. And it can look like a lot of different different people based on how you're gifted. But if you're walking in the abundance of Christ, you know it. And that's God's design. He doesn't want you to die in the desert. He doesn't want you in rebellion. He doesn't want you in sin. So he gives you grace to the humble. So we ask the question, where am I growing? That's humility. Because if you're you're not humble, you won't ask that question. You don't care. I'm just going to stay where I'm at. I'm good. I'm good to go. I die. I go to heaven. You know, salvation is free. Everything is free. I'm not willing to go down that path. The cost is too high. And so you miss out on abundant life. I pray that's not the case for you. Uh, In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul continuing to scorch the Corinthians in love, reproving them, in love trying to wake them up out of their 
their own idea of being spiritual. And yet they have a zeal for spiritual things. They're young in the Lord and there's correction. Chapter 10 is no, uh, no different. We're going to just read through the first 13 verses. It says all that we're talking about or will be talking about in the book of Numbers. You don't want to miss the book of Numbers. I'm telling you, it's a great book. Man, you get to see Korah's rebellion. Oh my goodness, God opens up the earth and just swallows people up because of their rebellion after they see the fire from God on and all. I mean, it's unbelievable some of the things in there. They continue to murmur. God sends snakes and says, now Moses put a, put a snake on the pole. What? No, he didn't say that. I would say that. Because he, 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 he understood God. When God said something, he just did it. He put a snake up on a pole, a bronze snake, one for judgment. Oh, what's that for? Well, Jesus would say in John chapter 3, remember remember the bronze pole that was on, uh, on the pole, the snake that was on the pole? Well, that, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to a cross. I'm, I'm going to be the emblem of, of sin. I'm going to have the, the wrath of God poured out upon me to take your sinfulness to get you my righteousness. Wow. In the book of Numbers. Great stuff. Great stuff. I hope you don't miss any of it. So 1 Corinthians chapter 10, it says, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud and passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. You know, I had a thought today, and I thought, Lord, ah, you know, the Old Testament, New Testament, I'm reading this, going to, everybody got baptized, right? They identified with Moses as we identify with Christ in burial, baptism, death to the old man, new life. They all went through, and then you read numbers, and you go, what? Did, did they know the Lord? Did they, they were baptized? Did you see what they did? You all read stuff, and you just shake your head, and you go, I can't believe they're, are they, are they believers? Are we going to see them someday? Oh, we don't want to be those people. So Paul would write this. Let me continue. All were baptized to Moses in the cloud and in the sea, all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with most of them, God, most of them, God was not pleased. Most of them, God was not pleased. For their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted, and do not become idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play, nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 fell. Nor let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents. Nor complain as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed, lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you except for that it's common to man. But God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. For, for those of you that think highly of the word of God, there may be a day where you can't read your Bible. I hate to tell you that, but it's time to hunker down and start taking to memory some of these precious principles. Uh, this is one of the first ones that I had a, a good discipler say, you need this one in your arsenal because you're a great sinner. I agree. <laughs> great sinners need Amen. the word of God in their hearts and they need to be readied to respond to the fiery darts of the enemy. I don't know about you, but fiery darts are, are coming on a regular basis. If they're not, I question how you're going forward or you're just staying stagnant, which, quite frankly, you can't be static as a Christian. You're either going this way or you're going this way. Dead fish flow down the river. you got to fight to get up it. it. It is a fight and it is a battle, and we're going there in a few minutes. But no temptation has seized me except for what's common to man, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you're able. And when you're tempted, he will make a way out to be able to stand under it. Take that one to heart. So when the trials come, the difficulties come, that you have some ammunition. Uh, back to numbers, I think. Uh, 
verses 2 and 3. Take a census of all the congregation of the children of Israel, by their families, by their fathers' houses, according to the number of names, every male individually, from 20 years old and above, all who are able to go to war in Israel, you and Aaron shall number them by their armies. If you will, in Moses' quiet time, God said, take a, t- take a census. And it better be God. For I remember right, King David did something similar. Remember? David wanted to count the men. 2 Samuel 24, 1 says this. Again, the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel, and he moved David against them to say, go number Israel and Judah. Interesting, right? The Lord told him that. But then we find out as we continue to read our Bible, 1 Chronicles 21.1, now Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel. So David said to Joab and to the leaders of the people, go and number Israel from Beersheba, Beersheba to Dan and bring the number of them to me that I may know it. God allowed it. God used Satan. And David's heart was open and primed to receive instruction from the enemy. I would suppose we could rightly say David didn't have very good quiet time during that period of time in his life. He wasn't hearing from the Lord. It made me think of um, a gentleman that's now home with the Lord. I've mentioned him before. Uh, Couldn't read, couldn't write. Um, So I would read the Bible to him. A broken man. Um, And he was an intercessor. And uh, he took it serious to death of praying for people. And there was a time when God was growing him in his understanding of intercession as he would wait on the Lord, he'd pray two, three weeks for one thing. He could just continue to pray. And I, I, I asked him every once in a while, he says, no, God didn't say anything. You know, but I just keep praying. Two, three weeks, one thing. He just continued to pray. And then God would give an answer. And there was a day when he said, God said, I'm going to have a test tonight. And I said, yeah, what kind of test? He said, well, God is going to speak to me, and then he was going to allow Satan to speak to me. And Satan would mask his voice because all he can do is counterfeit. He said, I know he's going to do that. And the next morning, his T-shirt was soaking wet because he was in the test of his life of hearing the voice of God. And I think, oh, my goodness. Can those things be true? Yes, God is personal. He wants you to know him as he knows you already. David knew the voice of the Lord. Moses knew the voice of the Lord. His children, Jesus said, you're a sheep. My sheep know his voice. There may be coming a day when you're going to have to rely on the spirit of God speaking to your heart. So again, I'm challenging you to develop that quiet time with the Lord. A conclusion I, I think you could have with the story of the, of the counting of God's people here in Numbers and the counting of David is uh, we ought to let God count the people, right? It's, we are so valuable in the sight of God individually. We are so valuable. And you've probably heard it before, but if you were the only one here, God would have died for you. He loves you that much. You have such high value in his sight. You're created in, in his image. And he loves you with an everlasting love. So each person is important. We dare not get on that path of counting people. Why would God have a census? I think it's a fair question. We have a census taking place. Let me give you some things I came up with. For war preparations, what happened to God fighting for them? You know, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. That's what I love. Just move away. God's going to take care. I, that's and there's a time and place for that when God will have you to stand still because you've done all that you can do. but he allows us to be co-laborers now with him to secure the victory, victory that he's already secured at the cross. We're in a battle, and you are soldiers. Now, you may be MIA. You, you may be uh, a prisoner of war. You may be AWOL, 
or you may be steadfast and immovable. Paul says, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast and immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your work of the Lord is not in vain in the Lord. Are you tired? Are you wearied? Has the enemy got your number? Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. One of the greatest things you can do when you feel the enemy come on strong is you go fight. Go talk to somebody about the Lord. Go hand out a track. Go to your quiet place and pray. Do something for the kingdom's sake when the enemy is chasing you. We're supposed to be on the offensive, not on the defensive. The enemy wants to start messing with you and bringing that person to mind that you shouldn't be thinking about. You start praying for that person. I'll tell you, the devil will leave just like that. He hates the prayers of the saints. You start praying when those thoughts come, and they will leave. Better yet, there's time when you can call somebody. Oh, I don't want to do that because they might think I'm a sinner. They know that. <laughs> and, and I say it much to like anybody else. It's a humbling thing. It's humbling for me. And I ought to be able to call Pastor Josh, Pastor, and anyone else, quite frankly, to say, hey, I'm struggling. Do I do it all the time? No. You know why? Because I'm a proud man. But God knows us from a distance when we're proud. So he wants us to humble ourselves and cry out. Sometimes it is a spouse. Sometimes it's a friend. Sometimes it's, you know, I have people that I meet with on a regular basis. And if you don't have that, there's another suggestion. Since I've been saved, I've always had someone to meet with every week. I, I can count the number on one hand in, in 30 years that I have not met with someone each week for the, for the specific purpose of saying, how you doing? And I don't have to go through this long story of all my shortcomings and all my weaknesses and all that. He, he already knows that. So the question is, how are you doing? And I have an opportunity to be real and say, man, I'm just struggling. I need some prayer. I need some encouragement. I need some counsel. If you don't have that in your life, you're getting ripped off. Because you got somebody, I have somebody that prays for me on a regular basis. When things take place in my life, he's, he texts me, how are things going in that? Man, encouraging that is. And if you don't have that, ask the Lord. Because someone else doesn't have it too. And he'll put you together. We need the body of Christ. We need one another. Can you imagine this thought just came um, in, over in China when the persecution is so bad underground? You know when they meet for church? When God says so. Because they can't take the chance of a mole coming in and for them to spread it around that we're meeting in this place at this time. So they say, we'll meet when God wants us to meet. Who? Uh, that stretches me. Because now you have to say, Lord, when and where? And they meet. And those that are being led by the Spirit are there. That may happen here. Are you ready? Why else would God have a census? I would say to delineate who could and couldn't fight. Right? That's what the scriptures say. Those are over 20. Uh, there's a certain age... I think they recognize that we're too old physically to fight. Um, there are no Levites. We'll get into that, I hope. Um, the Levites weren't part of that. They were taking care of God's things. The Meribites, the Kohatites, um, the three sons of, of uh, Levi, um, they would take care of the articles, uh, the tabernacle. They would take care of the sacrifices. They would take care of really protecting the people from invading the tabernacle because God would have just dusted them. So they were protecting God's stuff, if you will. So they weren't part of that uh, army, if you will. I think also to reveal his power in redeeming a people, two to two and a half million people. Why take a census? What a story that is. Wow. Two to two and a half million people. We'll find it at the end, end of the numbering, 603,000 men that were 20 years and above. So it doesn't take much of a mathematician to go, they had two million strong, probably closer to two and a half million people. And God takes a census to let the people know, to let the world know that he's in charge. He's large and in charge. And he's leading his people. And ultimately, why, why the census? To prepare the people for battle. Um, most people like to be prepared. My wife is one of those. She didn't want to find out at the last minute. What do you mean, what are we doing? How about a week before? Tell me this a week before so that I can prepare myself 
That's, that's a good thing. There's wisdom in that. I thought you just fly by the seat of your pants. I do that more than not, but that's why we're together, right? She balances me. But be prepared. You know, there's a preparation for the people now that they're going, ooh, this is serious. Uh, I don't think God's going to be showing up maybe like he used to. We got to fight. We got to fight? Oh, boy, different level of faith. Now we got to see him and we followed him, and now he says, no, 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 you fight. And are you going to be with us? And all of a sudden, the faith that you have has to grow because now you're, you're taking armament. You're fighting giants. You're fighting the unknown, and you have to trust God. He wants you to grow in faith. He wants you in the war. He wants you further than you are right now in the war. He wants you to grow as a soldier. And ultimately, to organize the people in groups or tribes for protection, efficiency, and ultimately to maintain order. Again, two to two and a half million people, you better have some order. Any good church has order because God is a God of order. And we've been talking uh, the last month or so about different places of leadership and your place in the body of Christ with the gifts God's given you. Why? Well, there's organization. We, we know that so-and-so does this and so-and-so does that. And so and so if you have a question, you need to see so-and-so. Well, there's, there, there's different levels of responsibility that God gives us as we grow. God wants you in those positions. Why? That's God. He sees things work very well when they're organized. If you see a, a church in chaos and Pastor Rich starts jumping pews, we got problems. <laughs> we, we, we won't see Pastor Ridge jumping pews. <laughs> He'll be tackling the person that does. Right? Because we're in God's church. It, it's his design. It, it flows well and it works. Uh, verse 4. Well, one last thing before you move to verse 4. To Jethro, uh, if you remember, uh, Moses' father-in-law suggested this in Exodus 18.21. Moreover, you shall select from all the people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifty, and rulers of tens. And Moses said, that sounds like God. And so he did it. And so he cared for the people, the number of people, by having leaders in different places, overseeing numbers based on their responsibility, based on their ability. God does the same thing today. Uh, verse 4, it says, And with you there shall be a man from every tribe, each one the head of his father's house. A representative of each family was chosen, if you will, the, chief, the chieftain of the tribe, uh, the patriarch, if you will, of the family. The twelve sons of Jacob not counting Levi, but instead Joseph had two sons, remember Ephraim and Manasseh. They were counted as part of the 12. And so we'll see 12 different tribes here that's established, organized, put into certain place, and you'll see uh, if we have a uh, clip at some point. Uh, there should be a, a clip of some, at some point of uh, uh, the tribes in order as God made them in order. There you go. Um, we'll get to that in a few minutes, but well, we got it up right now. What you're seeing there is different tribes. It may be hard for you where you're sitting, how far back you are, but they're delineated by sections. And there's a certain number from each tribe, the census, right? That's taken. We have Gad and Reuben and Judah, and we'll go through that in a minute. But they're told where to go and who's behind them, who's before them. In the very center there, you have the tabernacle. Uh, you have the Levites right around the tabernacle. And then you have the different groups that are assigned different places. So when they pick up to leave, which was many times, 30, 31 times, they're called the cloud to lift, uh, time to move again. They got to pick up all their stuff, and I know we don't understand any of that. But, <laughs> but it happens then, and it happens now. And so they'd pick up and they'd leave. Now, what they didn't get the advantage of seeing, and I'm sure now they're in heaven to get to see it, the prince of the power of the air got to see it, though. He got to look down, because this is a picture from, from the sky down. And he got to see the cross. I think that is so cool. The prince of the power of the air got to, got to chew on that for about 40 years. The cross and what God was doing at the very center of the cross was the holy of holies. His place, his presence where you and I can go at any given time. Isn't that cool? Uh, verse 5 then through 19, here's the challenge for me. The mentioned 
and mentioned by name. It says, these are the names of the men who shall stand with you, from Reuben, Eleazar, the son of Shadur, from Simeon, Shelemuel, the son of Zerashaddai, from Judah, Nashon, the son of Amminadab, from Issachar, Nathaniel, the son of Zur, from Zebulun, Eliab, the son of Helon, from the sons of Joseph, from Ephraim, Elishema, the son of Aminahud, from Manasseh, Gamaliel, the son of Pedahazar, from Benjamin, Abaddon, the son of Gidoni, from Dan, Ahizer, the son of Amishadai, from Asher, Pegiel, the son of Okran, from Gad, Elias, Elisaph, the son of Duel, from Naphtali, Ahira, the son of Enan. These were the chosen from the congregation, leaders of the fathers' tribes, heads of the nation of Israel. Then Moses and Aaron took them, these men who had been mentioned by name, and they assembled all the congregation together on the first day of the second month, and they recited the ancestry by families, by their fathers' houses, according to the number of names from 20 years old and above, each one individually, as the Lord commanded Moses, so he numbered them in the wilderness of Sinai. They knew their ancestry by heart. I think that was one of those I went, that's my wife does that ancestry stuff. Like genealogies are important, knowing where we came from, knowing our heritage, knowing, I believe, you know, as the sins of the Father can be passed on till we come to Christ and it's broken. I think the heritage that we are creating can be passed on as well. In other words, if you have a godly, a godly father, you ought to praise the Lord because he'd been praying and he'd been seeking the Lord and teaching and all the lessons that you learned and you get to pass that on? Oh, my goodness. You know, and for me, a first-generation Christian in my family, I see that great opportunity. I have five children, two stepchildren, and I've had the opportunity to pour into most of them a lot. And the things that I've seen, the things that I've learned, and I think, oh, heritage. I think of Pastor Josh and these two little boys. Oh, my goodness. And their daughter, of course, as well. It's a heritage that's beginning and righteousness that will continue line upon line as long as the Lord... Terry's, but what a great um, thing to consider as we're walking with the Lord, the impression that we're making on those that God has given us, a heritage, if you will, genealogies. And I think it's, it's worth pointing out. Take a look at your heritage, where you came from. You'd be surprised. You know, Jeff may find out. You mean there's guitarists and penis and in his back? I mean, I, it wouldn't surprise me that there's musical things in families um, that preceded us. There's something about that, the families that give birth to families, and there's something that takes place there. So they're mentioned by name from the tribe of Reuben, sort of some interesting meanings of their names. Uh, this Ilizer, uh, whose name is My God is a Rock, from the tribe of Simeon, this Shelemuel, whose name can mean My Peace is God. From the tribe of Judah, this Nashon, whose name can mean my people are noble. From the tribe of Issachar, Nathaniel, whose name can mean gift of God. From the tribe of Zebulun is Eliab, whose name can mean my God is father. From the tribe of Ephraim is Elishama, whose name can mean my God hears. Now, that man was the grandfather of, of uh, Joshua, which is interesting. Uh, from the tribe of Manasseh, Gamaliel, whose name can mean reward of God. From the tribe of Benjamin, Ibadan, whose name can mean my father's judge. From the tribe of Dan, Ahizer, whose name can mean my brother is a helper. From the tribe of Asher, Pegiel, whose name can mean met by God. From the tribe of Gad, Elisaph, whose name can mean my God is added or multiplied. And from the tribe of Naphtali, Ahira, whose name can mean my brother is evil. Meaningful uh, names, and I think we've lost that in our culture, not altogether. So most often Christians will, will pray about it. Lord, who is this? Because <laughs> he knows. He knows who we gave you. Um, we had the privilege of, I prayed last Sunday for our daughter, Rebecca, who had a great war going on for that little one. Not really sure why, uh, except uh, she had... Uh, 
cord wrapped around her neck four times at one point and ended up inducing and, and uh, she's fine. Six, six pounds, five ounces, 19 inch, 19 and a half inches. Uh, and they named her Sela. Sela, do you know the middle name? It's a Eliza. It, it's a Hebrew name. And uh, they thought it through and prayed it through. And I thought, ah, Sela. And she, from my understanding of Sela, it's a tough word in the, in the, in the Psalms. It's a um, mu- musical term most often viewed as a musical term of sort of a pause. Uh, but there are some that say, well, that it's pausing for what's just being said. You might want to take a moment and read through that again or meditate on those things that were just spoken. Um, and that fits. Very calm baby, very uh, even day old and just very calm. Names are important. Your name is important. And we know in the book that we're going to have a new name. Isn't that cool to think about? I wonder what God calls me. <laughs> but he's got names are important. And so he points them out here. And what's, to me, I had that thought of, oh, Lord, I'm going to have to stand before these guys someday and apologize to them. Butchering their names. I, I'm just hoping that they have an easier name in heaven. That I, I'm just saying, you know, God understands, but... Isaiah 43, one of my favorite verses early in my walk, because I was in, a, in my own wilderness, was Isaiah 43, 1 through 3. But now, thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you, and I have called you by name, and you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Isn't that good? Oh, man. He called you by name. You're his. The picture again, uh, how God is the age, the prince of the power of the air. had to look at this for 40 years. I love it. Uh, we will see reference of a snake, again, I mentioned early on a pole in John 3. Um, so be encouraged to come back. It's, it's a great book to study through and really have it study you. Um, the, as we conclude here, the, the census and the number of men, there is two census, the one we, we just read or we're going to read and the one in, in chapter 26. And you will find some disturbing things when you... Compare them, and I'm going to compare them with you. I'll make it quick. Um, instead of reading through, because I'll read the first one, and they all say the same thing with a different name and a different number, and I'll give you those numbers. But it's 20, verse 20 and 21. The children of Israel, uh, now the children of Reuben, Israel's oldest son, their genealogies by their families, by their father's house, according to the number of their names, every male individually from 20 years old and above, all who were able to go to war, those who were numbered of the tribe of Reuben were 46,500. Now, it says that again and again and again for every tribe. It just has a different number. So I'll just give you the name, and I'll give you the number, and then I'll give you the number in chapter 26. Reuben is 46,500. By the time we get to chapter 26, it's 43,700, minus 6%. Verse 22 to 23 is Simeon. Simeon has 59,300. By the time we get to chapter 26, before they enter the promised land, he's down, they're down to 22,000, minus 63%. Yikes. Verse 24 and 25 is Gad, 45,650. When they enter the promised land, it's 40,500, minus 11%. Uh, Judah is at 74,600. When they enter the promised land, it's 76,500, plus 3%. Verses 28 and 29, Issachar, uh, 54,400 at the first census, 64,300 at the second census, 18% to the plus. Zebulun was at 57,400. They ended up in the second census at 60,500 plus 5%. Ephraim in 32 and 33, 40,500. They come in at 32,500 minus 20%. Manasseh was at 32,200. They went up to 52,700, a 64% increase. 
Benjamin's at 35,400. They came in at 46,100, again, at plus 29%. Dan, 62,700. Second census, 64,400, which is a plus 3%. Asher is at 41,500. They come in at 53,400, plus 29%. Naphtali is at 53,400. They come in at 45,400 minus 15%. Total amount we find in 44 to 46 from ages of 20 and up, 603,550. They end up at 601,730, if you will, from 70 souls that went down to Egypt to two to two and a half million. God knew what he was doing. The question for you and I is, as you'll get to allow God's word to study you through the book of Numbers, you will find you're going in the right direction in an increase. Or there needs to be some repentance because you're going backwards and you've got some negative things going on. Many of these tribes, this is real stuff. This really happened. They got confronted with the same trials and they had different responses based on their heart towards God. And so many lost thousands and thousands of people because their hearts weren't right. I know it's our heart for you and for us that we abound, that we bear much fruit for the kingdom, that we take many souls with us when we go. So you think, I think there's challenge that's coming. And as we conclude 47 to 54, this is just about the Levites. We'll read through this and conclude. The Levites were not numbered among them by their father's tribe. For the Lord had spoken to Moses, saying, Only the tribe of Levi you shall not number, nor take a census of them among the children of Israel. But you shall appoint the Levites over the tabernacle of the testimony, over all its furnishings, all, over all things that belong to it. They shall carry the tabernacle and all its furnishings. They shall attend to the camp and round the tabernacle. And when the tabernacle is to go forward, the Levites shall take it down. And when the tabernacle is to be set up, the Levites shall set it up. The outsider who comes near shall be put to death. The children of Israel shall pitch their tents, everyone by his own camp, everyone by his own standard, according to their own armies. But the Levites shall camp around the tabernacle of testimony that there may be no wrath on the congregation of the children of Israel. And the Levites shall keep charge of the tabernacle of the testimony. Thus the children of Israel did according to all that the Lord commanded Moses. So they did. One final question. What tribe are you a part of? Anybody? I would say Olive Branch Fellowship. That's your tribe. God's brought you here. This is where he, you call home. That's why you're here. This is your tribe. Why is that important? Because when we're in a battle, if Pastor Josh and I have no interaction with each other and things go south, we're going to have problems discussing how to go forward. He can't really help me because he doesn't know me. And I can't help him because I don't know him. But if you're part of a tribe, you get to know people. That guy snores. Yeah, you're going to find that out at the men's retreat. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. Bring earplugs. But you're going to get to know people so you can lock arms with people for what? When difficult times come, you know who to call. Dude is really good at this. We need some help tree fell, whatever the issue is, there's a spiritual need. I have people call at times and say, hey, could you, just, could you pray? Absolutely, I'll pray for you. Because they know I'll pray. How did they know that? Well, they got to know me. They're part of the tribe. They're part of the tribe, Olive Branch Fellowship. This is their home. And so it's vitally important. And I'm so blessed to see how many men have decided to go forward for the men's retreat. It's just not a men's retreat. This is the time to lock arms. If, if the proverbial difficulties come in our world that a lot of people see, hey, we're right around the bend, tough times are coming, go to? Are you comfortable calling up and say, hey, I need some help? Because if you're not, we need to link arms to get to know one another so that we can fight together. We fight for the Lord together. I'm a Narnia fan, and I'll end with this. <laughs> Before they go to war, they, for Narnia! You know, it's for the kingdom. It's for Christ. We're here but a short time. We're a vapor. Here and gone tomorrow. Our days are hard. We want to present to the Lord a heart of wisdom. And so how do we do that? We come together and we say, okay, God, what has God called 
Olive Branch Fellowship to do. And then do it with all our might to the last day. And we give it all. We lay it out. And we say, Lord, we've done it all. We've done all that we can do. You deserve more, but we can give you all that we are. And say thank you for the opportunity to be called your children. Will you pray with me? Father, there is much said, I think, by your spirit today, at least the things I heard from me. Please, for your grace, to follow through with those things that uh, you encouraged us with, you, you, uh, you spoke to us about. Um, Lord, we want to be closely following you, especially as we see the days draw near, not only in fellowship, but pursuing you with a whole heart, that we might know you better, that we might be able to reveal others to you in a way that they would understand. We know that comes by knowing you. We see the, the, the models of Moses and Joshua, and we want to be like that. Would you give us the grace to fulfill that? That we, when we fight, we'll be fighting with you, knowing that you're going to fight through us and bring victory. We thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing and the things that you're in the process of doing in us for your glory and for your good, Jesus. It's in your name we pray.